what I would like to do uh, this afternoon is to pick up from our conversation uh, this morning about uh, reconciliation, this extraordinary gift of God's reconciliation and how it uh, constitutes or reconstitutes us into a, str a strange body, a strange body. Uh, for reconciliation is about bodies, uh, our own bodies, the bodies of others, and the body of Christ. Reconciliation is about bodies. In the letter to the Romans, Paul writes, chapter 12, verse 1 to 13, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, what is good, pleasing, and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each one of you. For just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the other members. Paul writes uh, in the letter to the Romans about our bodies and the body of Christ. The body of Christ is a favorite theme by Paul. But as I read Paul talking about the body of Christ, I feel that he's also drawing our attention to how odd, how strange this body of Christ is. Of course, Paul speaks about the different members that make up one body. However, the fact that the body of Christ has many members which are all different and yet they all belong together as one body, that is not what makes the body of Christ odd. That is not what makes the body of Christ strange. All bodies are like that. They are made up of different parts, of different members. So from that point of view, the body of Christ is not different from other bodies. That is not what makes it strange or odd. What makes the body of Christ strange or odd is its location and mission in the world. That is the reason why Paul frames this discussion of the body of Christ in its many parts by reminding us of this crucial verse. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, what is good, pleasing and perfect. This is what makes the body of Christ odd, strange. It is the relation of this body of Christ to other bodies, especially other social bodies. 
whether these bodies are marked by a natural, a racial, a tribal, a religious identity. There are other social bodies in the world and the defining characteristic of these other bodies might be racial, might be a natural identity, might be tribal or national identity. So you can talk about the body politic called America. That is a social body that is marked by a national identity. You can talk about in the case of uh, Rwanda, for example, of Hutu and Tutsi, each of these forming a community that is marked by a tribal identity that becomes so decisive in determining who is in or who is out. As many of you know, remember the genocide in Rwanda 1994 happened along these tribal ethnic identities. The church in Rwanda that found itself at the height of the genocide so neatly divided between Hutu and Tusi. But what is making the body of Christ odd, according to Paul, especially in this verse, is that it is distinct it cannot conform itself to the patterns of other bodies. It cannot just simply nicely fit into other bodies, whether these are racial, tribal, national, economic identities. He is talking, of course, about the church, and he's talking about us, our bodies, and how they are configured or reconfigured into the body of Christ. So what does it mean for the body of Christ to be in the world alongside other social bodies? How do we understand our call as Christians and members of Christ's body vis-a-vis -vis the other bodies that claim our identity? What I'm going to do this afternoon is to share three stories. And from these three stories, uh, maybe draw again three conclusions that kind of point to this invitation uh, about reconfiguring our bodies into the body of Christ and the mission in the world that is exactly the same mission that Paul is talking about in the letter to the Corinthians of being ambassadors in the world. The first story I want to share is really my own experience growing up and what that has taught me about being a Christian in the world. As I mentioned this morning, I was born and raised in Uganda. But my parents were born and raised in Rwanda, which is a smaller country south of Uganda in the eastern part of Africa. My parents moved to Uganda in the late 1940s and all of us, seven siblings, were born and raised in Uganda. One of the frustrating things for me as a young person growing up in this house of immigrants in Uganda was my parents' inability to learn Luganda. Luganda is the language of central Uganda where we were born. They tried. It's not for lack of trying. They tried. But however much they tried, they always spoke Luganda with an accent. That was so frustrating for us, especially when our classmates would come to visit us at home. We were so embarrassed by the way our parents spoke Luganda. For us, of course, we had grown up, been born in Uganda, and so, yeah, that was our mother tongue. But not for our parents. But it was so embarrassing for us. 
Matters were not helped when my father, an outgoing, dynamic person, decided to run and stand for the chairmanship of the Teacher Parents Association. But you've got to understand how complex this was. My father, a little bit I've told you about my father this morning, never went to school. But for some strange reason, he knew the value of education. And all he wanted was his kids to go to school. He was so passionate, he would go from house to house encouraging parents to take the kids to school. And so he would find a family and some of the kids are working there. He said, why is this young man here? So he would get them and enroll them in the school. <laughs> it was kind of a like, self-appointed <laughs> mission for making sure that everybody goes to school. So, of course, we went to school and then my father was elected the chairperson of the Teacher Parents Association that brings together teachers. I guess because of his advocacy in the community, his outreach and his great passion for education. So, as I said, he would go from family to family, encouraging uh, parents to send their kids to school and there were fees that were due. He would be the one to go remind the parents that, okay, um, the fees are due this time. Uh, and he would plead also with the headmaster for certain families, or oh, please wait on, they don't have the money right now. So he would play a key role. But the most embarrassing thing is that because he was now a chairperson of the Parent Teachers Association, he would come to school quite often. <laughs> so so, so, so you, can, you can imagine him coming to school quite often. And he was so outgoing, he didn't even realize what an embarrassment <laughs> he was for us. And now and again, he would ask to speak to us in assembly. Oh, I was in grade two, and he would almost hide behind the other, other kids when my father was speaking to us in the assembly because he couldn't speak Luganda right. He always spoke with an accent. So it became our mission as kids to teach our parents how to speak proper. <laughs> so we try to sit them down and say, no, no, this is what you say. My father would not even give us a chance. <laughs> but my mother would be attentive, so would say, okay, this is the word, repeat after me, matoke, and we say, matoche. No, it's not matoche, it's matoke. And so, and at times we'd make her repeat the sentence and then she would repeat and say, no, 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 no. And then we would repeat the sentence and say, and she said, that's exactly what I said. <laughs> she didn't even know that she had an accent. Well, well, I guess that's true of me. Some people come to me and say, you speak with an accent. And I say, who, me? No, she didn't even know that she had an accent. I think that has become very formative for me when I think about the invitation into the body of Christ. When I think about this verse, it reminds me of the invitation, of the encouragement. I urge you to not conform to the patterns of this word. It's an invitation for us to always speak with an accent. The word, in so many social bodies, are a kind of language, if you like. The church's relationship to these other social bodies is to bring that distinctive accent. But that means that the church is in the world and so speaks the local language, but it can never master that local language. It always speaks with an accent. What this means is that to black bodies, the church speaks with a white accent. To white bodies, the church speaks with a black accent. To liberal bodies, the church speaks with a conservative 
accent. To conservative bodies, the church speaks with a liberal accent. To married bodies, the church speaks with a female accent. To the female bodies, the church speaks with a male accent. To native bodies, the church speaks with a foreign accent. To foreign bodies, the church speaks with a native accent. The invitation that I feel that Paul is placing on us in this verse is how to speak with an accent and be okay with it. And be like my father, who would not even give us a chance <laughs> to, to try to get rid of his accent. What this means also concretely, that the mission of the church vis-a-vis -vis other bodies is not to make these other bodies more American, liberal, conservative, white, black, whatever it is. In Mirror to the Church, the book I wrote reflecting on the experience of Rwanda, Rwanda 1994, over 85% Christian, and in 1994, the churches, the schools, everything becoming a killing field. Christians killing other Christians in the same churches where they worshipped because of being Hutu and Tusi. Convents. Reflecting on that story of Rwanda, I talk about Rwanda as a social body and the stories that went into the formation of Rwanda, the stories that made Rwanda what it is, and how within Rwanda there are only two ways to be, either Hutu or Tusi, even though traditionally there was also uh, the Batwa. But also where traditionally there would be moments of moving back and forth between these identities. But with the with the movements of colonialism and the codification of identities and the issuing of national identity cards that identified each one as either Hutu or Tusi, there was no movement anymore. Everybody became Hutu and Tusi or Tusi. It was either or the church fit itself quite comfortably within that anthropology of bodies, They're either Hutu bodies or Tusi bodies, and never saw clearly that her invitation was to be a body that speaks with an accent within Rwanda society. The church saw its mission as one of making Rwandans more Christian. But the Rwandans had already been so defined in such a way that they are either Hutu or Tosi. So the church's mission was kind of building on that so-called natural anthropology identity. And when Shove came to push in 1994, the genocide, the fractures between Hutu and Tusi played themselves very neatly within the body of Christ. Christians killing other Christians. Such as that Cardinal Echagali was sent by Rome to visit Rwanda at the height of the 1994 to ask the question, do you mean to say that the blood of tribalism is deeper than the waters of baptism. The challenge was that the church never saw itself as an old body. But her attempt was how do we fit within these aspirations called 
Rwanda, how to make Rwanda more modern, how to make Rwanda more democratic, how to make Rwanda more successful, how to make Rwanda a shining example of mission work. I conclude that book by saying, given that reflection, that I've come to the realization that the mission of the church, whether in Rwanda or in other places, the mission of the church is not to make America more Christian. The mission of the church is not to make Rwanda more Christian. The mission of the church is to make Americans less Americans. Rwandans less Rwandans. So that together we can realize what it means to be the body of Christ. The mission of the church is not to make a Hutu more Christian, Tusi more Christian, conservatives more Christian, liberals more Christian, but to make conservatives less conservative, liberals less... That, that is the mission of the church. There's always a kind of an interruption in a way that it responds to this call by Paul not to conform to the patterns of this world. It is only by kind of drawing us in, out of these neat social bodies that we can reconfigure our bodies into that body of Christ that stands as a witness, as the agent of God's reconciling love in the world. Learning to speak with an accent. The second story I want to tell, again that has come to let me appreciate what Paul is getting to in this invitation, is the story of Buddha. Buddha is a high school Catholic seminary in Burundi. Young boys in Catholic, in high school, with the hope that some of them will join the seminary perhaps become priests. Burundi is another small country next to Rwanda, in case we are challenged by the geography of, Af <laughs> of Africa. But that doesn't happen here. You are very... <laughs> yeah. But Burundi is another small country next to Rwanda. Both of them share a similar history. Both of them were Avenger originally colonized by the Germans. But when the Germans lost the war, the colonies were given to the Belgians. So both of them are former Belgian colonies. Uh, in Burundi, just as in Rwanda, there are two main groups, Hutu and Tutsi. And the history of these two countries is similar, characterized by killings, by genocide, one after another, one group trying to uh, wipe out, wipe out, wipe out uh, the, the other, alongside these ethnic uh, boundaries. In 2007, uh, in the midst of the war, the militias attacked this high school called Buta. And they knew that at Buta there were students there that were both Hutu and Tutsi. Even though all the schools had closed, Buta remained open. And the rector, Father Zachary, uh, continue to remain committed to sh bringing up, teaching these students uh, in a, a new way of reconciliation of unity. So the rebels attacked the seminary at night. The rebels were headed by a very fierce woman commander. She was the one commanding the rebel forces. They stormed in the dormitories at night and told the students to separate. Who to students on one side and to see students on the other. The students didn't move. Three times she gave the order. The students didn't move. Then she gave the order for the militia to fire. And they started firing indiscriminately in the crowd. Forty students were killed. Forty 
What are the grave sites of these four students that are called at Buddha the martyrs of unity, the martyrs of reconciliation? One student who was wounded, but unknown to himself that he was wounded, uh, escaped from the dormitory and ran to the principal's office, the rector's office. The rector had had the gunshots and he had taken cover in his bedroom. So this student knocked and called, Father Rector, open for me. It's Jerome, please open for me. So the principal, the rector came out and opened the door and this student rushed inside the rector's office and told the rector what had happened. Father, they told us to separate and we refused. We have won. And the student collapsed and died from the wound. They told us to separate. We refused. We have won. What an odd victory that is. We have won. Perhaps this is what Paul is talking about when before this crucial verse, the first verse he says, brothers and sisters, I urge you in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. I urge you, I entreat you, I plead you. There is something urgent in Paul's message. To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. An odd body of these young boys who to, to see together. Later on, I had a number of conversations and interviews with the rector. I said, why do you think these students, first of all, were at school when the other schools closed because of the war? And that director says, because I insisted and invited them to come back. Now, I feel so terrible that this has happened. But on the other hand, we have, we have no choice. But then second, I started to reflect and say, well, you know, one of the things that we did from the early on to encourage a culture of communication, of talking, throughout the activities, classes, debating clubs, and so forth, we invited students to always speak up and be able to share with one another, regardless of who the other is. If you feel that this brother is different and so forth, tell them. Uh, so he encouraged that kind of culture of openness, of talking, uh, and that in that way, through this kind of talking, dialogue, disagreement, the body was built together. Thirdly, he said, we always had fun, especially we made out of picnics and so forth, in playing together, soccer, and, and eating together. In the process, carrying that, a fundamental unity was developed so that the students began to see each other as students of Bota, but not as Hutu of brothers, as Christians, not necessarily Hutu, Tusi, who happen to be Christians. There is something about this odd body and about this odd winning that speaks to about, uh, speaks to this charge that Paul puts before us. The third, the third story I want to talk uh, to tell is a story that we know all very well. 
It's the story of the community of Ephesus, the Ephesian community, to whom Paul writes this letter from prison. The letter to the Ephesians is one of the most upbeat letters. You can almost feel Paul's excitement and the joy and the exuberance in the letter to the Ephesians when he writes the dividing wall has been broken we who used to be far apart are fellow sojourners fellow travelers living together working together the, the word together comes up so many times building together the edifice it gives the metaphor of the temple building together the temple working together building up the body so of Christ and Paul is very a bit about that congratulating if you like the Ephesians for coming to that what had happened what was it behind the Ephesian community that kind of sends Paul into this magnificent, this song of thanksgiving? Well, there are two communities in Ephesus. The Jewish community and the Gentile community. In the Acts of the Apostles, a solution had been reached up about these, how do we deal with the Gentiles and things like that. And the Acts of the uh, Apostles had come to this kind of compromise. Let the Gentiles uh, observe, let's not kind of really press too many challenges on them and the Jews. So it's kind of like coming to a compromise. Let there be two communities. Paul would never have any of that. We are all one unity, one body comes back to that over and over again for, for Paul it cannot be two separate communities it is all one all of us being built up together to be the body of Christ that's what Paul praises in the letter to the Ephesians in other words he's making the argument that Jewish Christians by themselves are fragments Gentile Christians by themselves are fragments and none of the fragments is enough. Of course, the tragedy of fragments always as Father Alexander Schmemann, the Orthodox theologian reminds us, the tragedy of fragments is to exclude the other, to always say, no, this, this is it, this, only, only here, no, <laughs> no other. But Paul is saying, we are all fragments by ourselves, Jewish, um, Gentiles, uh, Rwandan, uh, African, American, by ourselves. This is not interesting because we, we don't reflect the body of Christ. It is only by coming together, it's only by journeying together, it's only by working together that now comes Paul's favorite expression that we constitute the full height of Christ's full stature. It's only by coming together that that full height of Christ's full stature is revealed. Alone, by ourselves, in different kind of with main fragments. It's only by coming together that we realize the full stature of what it means to be the body of Christ. And in Ephesian community, what had actually happened and what Paul celebrates especially is that that coming together had happened when the Ephesians finally decided it's time that Jews and Gentiles eat together. It had happened over meal eating. They started eating together unheard of for a self-respecting Jew to eat with a Gentile? Come on! <laughs> That's the worst thing that can happen! But here they are kind of 
rebellious community, if you like, coming together and sharing the table together, eating together. That is what Paul is celebrating, that it had happened over what used to be the final dividing wall. It was the meal that was the final dividing wall. But now that has been broken. We who used to be far apart now can sit together, can eat together. This is very significant in terms of constituting this old body. It is constituted through and with and within the very acts of eating together. There is a materiality around here. It's about the mouth. It's about the, what some of my African brothers and sisters call. It's about the fellowship of swallowship. <laughs> or <laughs> it's the swallowship that area constitutes that. Or as the one and proverb says, unless you hear the mouth eating, you cannot hear the mouth crying. It all begins by learning to eat together. Learning to eat together across divides. It is this experience that was replicated in other places in Antioch and so forth that made the Christian community a unique community and they didn't even know what to call them. So at Antioch they called them were those strange followers of the strange way. They were called Christians for the first time, the followers of the strange way. But it's just eating together. I want to stress the high level of eating together because it cannot be a spiritual unity. Oh, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ in a wonderful spiritual fellowship. It has to do with learning to eat together across divides. It has to do with munching together. It has to do with economics across divides. Across the racial divides, for example. How do we create, in a way, Communities that learn to eat together across these racial divides, across cultural divides, across the cultural wars of conservative and liberal. How do we learn to eat together? In the process of eating together, we discover actually that what divides us is not as interesting as what brings us together. This is what I learned, among other things, when I was at Dirk as a Catholic among Methodists and Evangelicals. Or when I went to Lausanne, at first I thought it was too evangelical, and then I realized that, well, I am evangelical at heart. <laughs> when I went to Dirk and the people were saying, so what are you doing, a Catholic priest teaching in a Methodist? I said, most of my friends are. In the process of eating together, we realized that actually we share much more. That's what we try to duplicate in the Center for Reconciliation as we organize the different events in East Africa that we brought together different members of different uh, traditional background and so forth. And we pretend that we didn't even know that, for example, in Uganda, Anglicans and Catholics don't talk to one another. So we invited. And they came together. And we started sharing the story of God's reconciling love and so forth. And before I know it, the friendship that we imagine there is this bishop, huge bishop, Nkuruntanda from Congo, uh, who came to Uganda in fear and trembling because they know that Uganda was actually fighting in the Congo and he didn't know what he was going to find. And then, of a day or two of storytelling, of eating together, he said, Wow, I'm changing my ticket. He changed his ticket to stay an extra three days <laughs> to visit newly found friends that he didn't know even existed if he had remained in those abstract us against them in other words the encouragement is here how do we learn to trust this crossing of boundaries seeking out the other learning to eat with the other who is different from us this is the way we do not conform to the patterns of this world. This is the way that also we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice that represents, that illumines the body of Christ in the world. 
Let me conclude. Three observations. One, Christian life is about bodies. Bodies matter. Our bodies, the bodies of others, and how these bodies are configured and reconfigured to the body of Christ. That is located within the world with other social bodies. This is the heart of ecclesiology, of what it means to be church. This is the heart of Christian ministry. This is the heart of Christian preaching. Two, Christian preaching illumines, illumines the body of Christ in the world and offers an invitation to a strange place, to a strange journey, to an odd body. And here Paul uses the notion of ambassadors being invited into that middle, into that odd, strange place. Being of a place, but not being of a place. Being in a place, but not being of a place. Three, this strange place is a place of learning to eat together across divides. So in other Christian preaching is an invitation to risk eating across divides. Not to be afraid of eating with the other who is different from us. Not to be afraid of engaging realities that affect the body of the other, economics, health. This is the stuff through which in a way, our bodies become reconfigured to the extent that we who used to be apart are now coming together and no longer two but one body. It's the material practices of everyday life. This is what makes the body of Christ the body of Christ. This is what makes the body of Christ odd. So that others can say, who are these people? Are they Americans? Are they Africans? Are they Hutu? Are they Tusi? Are they Catholic? Are they Anglicans? Are they Evangelical? Are they Gentiles? Or Jews? Or Greeks? For Paul, we who used to be far apart and no longer two. There is no more black or white, male or female. It's not that he does not see the biological differences anymore, but those differences have become less interesting in view of this invitation to be the body of Christ. Thank you.